Hello everyone, my name is Gabriel Ellis. I'm a psychologist, psychotherapist, and long-term meditator slash Buddhist meditator. And in this video, I want to highlight another connection between uh, original Buddhism and modern psychology. The topic of today is intuition, self-feeling, gut feeling, and what we can um, take from the Buddhist tradition what they have to say about it, how can we reflect on it from a more Buddhist perspective, and how we can implement this in our lives. When I speak about intuition, I want to uh, provide two categories, two groups of internal phenomena that I want to surmise under this label of intuition. The first is self-feeling. And self-feeling is what I call how I fundamentally relate to myself and the world. Now, this is unconscious. It lies at the root of our personality. Uh, it guides our thoughts, our feelings, our actions. We usually don't perceive it. It uh, encompasses our basic attitudes, values. Am I generally open? Am I optimistic, pessimistic? conscientious? What are my conviction, convictions about the world? What is my conviction about how, how lovable I generally am? How do I deal with authorities or disagreements? What kind of people do I like to connect with? What kind of people do I like to distance myself from? Those kinds of patterns, they are not random. They make us who we are. We don't, in every situation, choose a new we follow certain patterns and those patterns, they are based on what I want to call self feeling. Again, this is something that is entirely unconscious and lies at the base at the root of our personality. At some exceptions, though, we come to notice that our self feeling has changed. It becomes noticeable, for example, when we are sick, when we take certain meds, when uh, drastic events happen, and then we realize that something is off. Maybe I, I notice them, I relate to the world in a much more pessimistic way, or that I, uh, I'm walking on, uh, on uh, clouds today, and I'm very optimistic that everyone, every person seems fine. I'm able to con connect with any kind of person and so on. So under these circumstances, we cannot really, you know, put our finger onto it, but we understand, okay, somehow my relation to the world, to myself has substantially changed in a way that changes everything. Okay. so. This is what I call self feeling. As I said, mostly unconscious, only in very uh, exceptional situations and circumstances, we can become conscious of them. From that, I would like to distinguish the moods. Moods are half conscious in um, any kind of situation, usually when we want to, when we are asked to do it, uh, we can make our moods conscious, but there are some kind of a fog which remains at the background of our daily conscious mental activity. Um, they color usually what we experience, they color what is in the foreground of our attention, the foreground of our mental experience, um, but it is quite noticeable. So we do know uh, that on any given situation or day, we are euphoric or melancholic. Uh, this is often subtle. It influences what we perceive. It filters out the aspects that the mood is inclined to perceive. So I, if I'm in a melancholic mood and I'm talking to people, I might be reminded, for example, how isolated I sometimes am from others. So what I perceive is a reflection of the mood that I went into the conversation with at the first place. Also, those moods are not random. They also are an expression of my personality, of my individuality, and they are an expression 
of the self feeling that is usually entirely unconscious. Both self feeling and moods are integral parts of our personality. And as much as we as people would like to be free in our expression, free in our filtering and uh, our relation to the world, we are still always limited to a certain sets, set, a certain fingerprint, if you will, of moods and self feelings that guide us through our life and that also make, make us recognizable for others when they see us. People usually are not in every situation wondering who they're dealing with. They see patterns and they see the patterns that we display, that we express uh, those unconscious base self relations with. In the best case, when we do live a normal, a satisfied, a happy life, self feeling and moods are like a well oiled machine. In the end, they are supposed to guide us to filter our experience in a way that is that is uh, appropriate and that is practical for us. They're supposed to give us an adequate interpretation of what happening, what is happening around us, an adequate interpretation if the people around us mean harm or mean well. Uh, they should support us in the choice of actions that what we choose is beneficial for us, ideally also beneficial for others. They should not limit our intelligence and so on. So in the end, they are, of course, not there for, you know, a random reason. They're supposed to support our ego, our self, our daily life, our experience. And this is what people hope for when they look for the inside as, um, as a guide. This is what we're looking for when we're looking for our, our gut feeling, when we're looking for intuition. We're looking for something like a wise counselor that supports us in the best way of how to manage complex situations. But my clinical practice shows very different uh, examples. People usually come, and this is the broadest category um, in general, people usually come with some sort of anxiety, some sort of emptiness, depression, life issues, relationship issues. Now, whether they're able to express it or not, but often uh, at the root of it, at the base of it, there is a self feeling, there are moods that actively obstruct their daily life. They obstruct the way that they interpret conversations with their partners, with a family at work. They make them do things that are not beneficial for them. And this is often quite frustrating. People usually know this. They see that what is happening inside of them is not supportive. And it can come to a place when I'm not only insecure, but I'm afraid that impulses from the inside will come up, that strong feelings from the inside will come up because experience has showed me that I went on a slippery slope with them and it led me to do things to communicate in a way that was not good for me, that I regretted afterwards, and that was not good for others. So my inner counselor was off. They did not counsel me in the right way. So what is supposed to be a support system for me, that I have a trusted friend that, you know, doesn't decide, but gives me good counsel of how to act and react in certain situations in daily life. This is exactly the source that I cannot trust and that I learn to be intimidated by. So, the question is now, if my inner compass, if my intuition, if my gut feeling give me bad advice, is there something that I can do? Well, of course there is. Our culture has developed certain tools to deal with that. In the old times, uh, religion was 
often um, you know, the support system. Uh, it was not very precise. It had a different perspective uh, on life, you know, depending on which religion it was or which of the individual people were that were counseling, they might have been gifted or not. Uh, in today's life, uh, the field that society has developed in order to help us to develop our self feeling and our moods is therapy, simple as that, right? When we have issues, when our inner compass is off, when I perceive myself as partly an enemy, or at least, you know, not a companion, then I have an issue. And it's only a question of time until I run into issues in the outside world as well. So I go to therapy, I describe my issues depending on the therapy school uh, that I'm involved with. I give certain advice. And in the end, hopefully, I come out with a relation to myself, a relation to my intuition and gut feeling that is well. Now, what is important for therapists to keep in mind, and here is one transition from this very um, basic topic of self healing and moods to therapy, what therapists have to keep in mind is to alternate between practical advice, solution oriented advice, and a more fundamental perspective. What I mean with that is, when, um, let's say a client comes with anxiety, or relationship issues, then, of course, we can support them with practical tips. Maybe you can do that. Maybe your partner means that when they say this, maybe you can request something. Maybe you can do this exercise, a communication exercise. Maybe you can, you know, use a gratitude journal. Uh, you can talk about your feelings. So these are very uh, precise, concrete measures and means, tools to deal with concrete communication, social or emotional situations. Okay, so far so good. But as a therapist, uh, I also need to keep in mind to zoom out and to ask my clients, how do you relate to yourself? What is your typical attitude towards yourself? Are you generally a lovable person? Are you worthy of appreciation? How do you see the world? Are you optimistic? Are you open or are you pessimistic? And then we take all of these self related um, responses, the sets of values and basic attitudes towards myself, and we question them. So what is your general thought if you go into a crowd and there are people? What is your general attitude? Do you think that you're able to keep, uh, you know, a benevolent, interesting conversation? Do you walk up to them or are you shy? Okay. When they give me an answer, for example, no, usually I'm a little bit hesitant. I'm shy. I don't know what I'm talking about in small talk. So I try to avoid that. Then I can ask the client, okay, do you agree with this attitude? Are you okay with it? And depending on that response, I can move on to question their self feeling their self relation. If someone is not okay with being overly shy, for example, or overly uh, confident, which might be the case also that that brings problems, then we're starting to work in a very subtle way on the self feeling, because then I'm disagreeing with my programming so to speak. I'm disagreeing with the pattern that I'm displaying that I have come to learn and come to see over the years. So I disagree with my habitual patterns. And then we start to chew. You know, the chewing is kind of a metaphor that comes from Gestalt psychology, which means we don't just swallow you know, a new attitude, a new value, we start to chew. What would I like to be instead? How does that relate to other values that I have? How do I perceive other people who are shy or overly confident? What do I think about them? Can I put myself in their shoes and so on? So we start to take something that is isolated, which 
is the new idea of how I should be, how I want to be in a certain situation. And we start to relate it to other aspects of my life, other aspects of my personality to assess if this would be really a good move to uh, go in that direction, to develop in that direction. Okay, so this is the basic issue as I try to lay it out this basic issue lies at the heart of many issues that people come with in therapy. Uh, and therapy has a certain approach to it. And um, the more I think the more conscious the therapeutic approach is, the therapist is about that, the more they have um, a possibility to consciously adjust, uh, assess and change this very basic self relation, the self feeling and the moods that guide us in our daily situations. Now, I started by saying that I want to build a bridge between Buddhism and psychology. So the question is now, what does it have Buddhism to contribute? What does it have to say about the topic of self feeling and intuition? And uh, depending on how much you know about Buddhism, you might be surprised to hear that actually it has a lot to say about it. Now, generally, our understanding of Buddhism is that it's about liberation, maybe peace of mind, meditation, and so on, and that these are the kind of the high aspects that Buddhism wants to contribute to implement in our life, that we should lead a good life, be peaceful, and meditate. This is certainly true. But in this perspective, what is lost is that Buddhism is quite aware of its fundamentals. And here I'm talking about original Buddhism. This is the historical Buddhism that developed 2000, about 2,500 years ago in Northeast India by the historical Buddha. Buddhism, of course, is a very long uh, standing tradition in so many countries. So the let's say 200 300 years after the buddha buddhism became much more abstract theoretical and moved on to flower and flourish into many other um, traditions so what i want to focus on is the original buddhism and in the original buddhism there is a concept that is called sila in pali or shila in sanskrit and it means something like right conduct or right ethics and I'll come to talk about why this was important uh, for Buddhism to begin with. But in any case, right conduct, right ethics, sila, lies at the basics, at the beginning of the Buddhist path. And it addresses directly the self-feeling and the moods that we have. What is the definition of sila in the Buddhist texts. Now, uh, as usual in the old Buddhist texts, they are quite pragmatic. There are, of course, philosophical aspects there, but they're mostly practical. And the practical definition of right conduct and right ethics is that before, during, and after I act, speak, and think, I should evaluate and assess if I am not harming myself or not harming others. So we have three fields of life and three time periods before I act, while I act, after I act. I reflect, did I harm myself or did I harm somebody else? And the same I do with communication, speaking, and my thought world, my internal world. Uh, I can give you an example of how I personally started out to practice Buddhism, which is more than 20 years ago, I was inspired by these texts, especially. And I started to reflect on um, how I relate to myself in daily life. And one thing that occurred to me, I was a student back then, one thing that occurred to me is that immediately when I woke up, after waking up, like in the first minute, I started to think about my day's structure, what I have to do, uh, the goals that I need to accomplish, the you know, to-dos that I have to check off the list. 
and so on. So this was my habitual approach to my daily life. Every morning, this is what I did. And because it was so habitual, I was not even paying attention to it anymore. But inspired through the, the Buddhist texts, I started to ask myself, okay, how am I actually thinking? What am I actually doing? And there's, of course, an awareness aspect there as well. So I realized that this is the habit that I have in the mornings. I also realized that this kind of thinking, the, you know, checking the to do's, uh, assessing how I've done the last day, what I need to do the next day and so on, that this way of thinking was not emotionally neutral. It was somewhat distressing in a subtle way. I, I didn't have the habit of being self-punishing or uh, looking down on myself for not having achieved something. But regardless, I woke up and started to stress myself out, to put it in simple terms. Now, you might do something very simple, similar. Actually, I think that many people have some sort of habit like that. But now imagine if what I'm doing, what I did to myself, I would do to my partner. So if I were to wake up in the morning, my partner is lying next to me, she wakes up. And the first thing that I say is I start to bombard her with the things that she would have to do this morning uh, and throughout the day and uh, what she should not let slip, what she missed doing yesterday and how important this or that activity is. Of course, my girlfriend would be upset, and rightly so. This is what I'm doing to myself. I'm just not realizing the emotional impact that it has because I'm so used of doing, uh, doing it to myself. It's become so habitual that I don't realize the emotional impact that this very normal, so to speak, approach has, the effect that it has on me. And now you have to keep in mind that this is not one thing that we do. So when I'm describing this somewhat normal student life that I had back then, this was just how I started the day and describing the small kind of contribution of distress that I put on myself without knowing it. This has an additional cost because I'm riding this kind of wave of distress throughout the day. And I'm adding new aspects on top of that. Effectively, the outcome of that is a much more significant and noticeable self-harm. And this is something that the Buddhist texts advise us to stop doing. I'm harming myself with this way of thinking. And of course, uh, I can bring many more examples of um, how I can harm myself and others in uh, communication, in acting. Uh, I just want to point out again something that is therapy relevant. How am I talking to myself? Many people, when they come to therapy, discover when I ask them to observe their thoughts that they're highly self-critical, that they're putting the self down, they're very disappointed by themselves because of high aspirations and so forth. And again, without noticing it, I have to bring it out, we have to bring it out into awareness in the therapeutic process, what kind of secondary uh, price they pay by that. The intention is not to harm themselves. Of course, you know, the intention is good. They want to remind themselves of the important things that they want to do. The goals that they want to achieve and they're merely disappointed and frustrated by not achieving those goals but effectively what is happening is that they're creating negative a negative self-image negative feelings and thus an intuition a self-relation that is not appropriate anymore it's off there's too much self-criticism in the system especially when they can perceive it from the outside Okay, so when I personally started to implement those Buddhist principles of right conduct and right ethics 
in my life with time, because this is a slow process to reprogram my uh, relation to my thoughts, uh, my acts, my uh, the activities, the communication that I have with the people surrounding me. This is a slow process. It will not immediately revolutionize my self feeling and my moods, but with time, there was a very noticeable effect. And I started to see how my attitude towards myself started to brighten up. I was more aware of creating quality time for myself and others when I spent time with them. And I became less judgmental over time. And this is something that the mind definitely benefits from. And now when, as in Buddhism, we have an idea, a plan for a very specific self-development, a self-development that is based on benevolence, that is based on good conduct, that should lead to meditation, then it becomes so much clearer why the adjustment of the self-feeling, the adjustment of the moods out of which my daily thoughts and feelings and assessments and so forth spring from, why that is at the core, the basis of the Buddhist practice when we start out. And this is exactly also what is off when people develop anxieties, depressions, life issues, relationship issues. This is what is off for them because without knowing it, they have treated themselves badly. They have developed habits that are not good for them, not good for the people around them, and thus created an internal monologue counseling system, our gut feeling, our intuition that is off and without knowing it does not have our best interest at heart that follows other more self defiant self destructive ideas. Okay, now, as I said uh, about the middle of my talk, um, there is a goal of Buddhism. And it uses this self relation, the self feeling, the moods to get there. The goal of Buddhism is to develop a peace of mind that transcends the world. This is the high goal that original Buddhism had. We don't need to implement that in our life in order to benefit from Buddhist practice. But in order to get there, uh, there was a three part kind of development that they had in mind. It starts with sila, with right ethics, right conduct. The next step is samadhi, which is meditation. The third step is panya, which means wisdom and insight into the deeper aspects of our nature, of our mind, and thus being able to transcend issues on a much more fundamental level so that this transcendental peace of mind this sort of liberation or whatever it signifies is available and possible. And I hope that it became clear how the adjustment of the self feeling of the moods in Buddhism is directly feeding into and contributing to the next step, which is the meditation, the Samadhi. Because what I'm developing in my mind, when I practice good conduct is a non judgmental, a peaceful state of mind that is okay with itself. That is, after some practice, really hesitant to harm itself, which develops an intuition that when something is off, when I'm in a conversation, for example, I'm starting to become harsh. The peace of mind that I have practiced so far, it gives me, you know, the spidey senses that, okay, I, something is off. I don't feel really good in the way that I communicate right now. I see in the reaction then on others that they don't feel really comfortable and I'm so much faster to adjusting it. Same with the thoughts that I have within myself, same with the attitude that I have towards myself, same with the activities that I have in uh, our so complex society. So the proper development of self feeling, the proper nourishing of a good mood within myself, automatically in Buddhism 
leads to the correct foundation for starting the meditation process to begin with. And so often as a meditation instructor, when beginners came into the meditation group and they expressed their expectations, their hopes, why they want to meditate, and they started meditating, and after that they reflected and shared uh, how it went down, so often people are bothered by the thoughts that come up. Not only that, with a frustration that was the reaction to the thoughts being uh, coming up and not being able to concentrate. And then with a the self-judgment that follows the frustration. So people come with a state of mind that is quite chaotic. I think many of us can relate to that. They're given a meditation instruction. It sounds all nice on paper and the books and the YouTube videos. It all makes sense, right? But then we sit down, we close our eyes, we start to concentrate on the breath, the mantra, whatever. And then the reality of our mind comes to the foreground with distraction, with stress, with memories, plans, and it doesn't, it doesn't let go. It doesn't let us do what we set out to do. We would like to take a break in this 20 minutes, 30 minutes, or an hour of meditation, but our habitual mind doesn't allow it. And then people get frustrated. This frustration is for someone who is self-perceptive, for someone who is used to notice if they're harming themselves. This frustration would already be visible as some sort of self-harm. For someone who is well-practiced, they would recognize it and be able to eliminate this frustration, replace it with something more positive, self-forgiveness, for example, patience diligence, right intention. But the unskilled beginner reacts with frustration, as we do. And out of this frustration comes a self-judgment of, oh, I'm, not, I'm not good enough for this, or this meditation is stupid, this instructor is stupid, Buddhism, I don't know what the fuss is all about. So judgment springs out of the frustration because the frustration needs to be it's an unpleasant feeling. It's an unpleasant experience of myself. So I want to get rid of it. And a normal, habitual way of getting rid of frustration is judgment, judging myself, judging others, the practice. So this is the unskilled development that in many cases leads to people starting, trying to meditate, but then giving up. The more I am capable of recognizing what is happening within myself in normal life, not in the meditation, in normal life, this is why we practice. The more I have experience with correcting my habitual thoughts and attitudes to non-harm, which leads to a relation to myself that is positive, the more I do that, the more I can sit down in meditation, be really curious about what is happening, be able to direct my awareness, my intention, benevolently to the meditation object, whatever that is, and in the end, to reap the fruits of this practice. Okay, this is it for today. I hope you were interested in uh, my reflections. Maybe you took something a way for your own reflections of on reflections on your daily life, on your self-talk, on the communication with others. And if you are a beginner in this way of thinking and practicing, just take the last bit that I described. When frustration comes up, see it as something that is slightly self-critical self-sabotaging, replace it with something that is more positive, which is self-forgiveness, diligence, patience, and continue to practice in a way that you see right, that is good for yourself, that is good for others. If you like, you can leave the practice on that level. There's nothing wrong with that. If you want to take those insights from higher states of mind, to the application of just normal life, 
I think that's valuable enough. And if you're motivated, you can continue and try some contemplation method of your liking, some meditation of your liking to see if it's for you. Thank you so much for your attention and I hope to see you next time.